Hello again. Hey. How you doing? <laughs> oh, you know, it's been a long day. We've we've had we've overcome our technical difficulties. <laughs> That's right. To a certain extent, yeah. Maybe <laughs> maybe we'll make it thirty seconds. We we don't know. Hello, everyone. We saw we're sorry to abandon you a few minutes ago. Um, but we're back. Uh, and here is um. Here we are. Yeah. I'm Jeremy. I'm Claire. And I'm Kelly. And we're this here. This is our yeah, Enneagram Shakespeare series. Yeah. We're we're here tonight talking about number two. <laughs> uh, which is also, by the way, one of the numbers uh, that I might be. <laughs> Uh, I might be a number two. I feel like I understand twos, maybe more than other numbers. Interesting. So, uh, anyway, that's for what that's worth. I, I, I'm interested to get into this because I think I might, I think I might have a lot of twoishness about me. And I don't feel like I understand this one at all. I really struggled to come up with them this time around. So I'm interested to hear what you guys have to say. But um, <laughs> my two cents on the two is that I, that is my least compatible. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I'm with you guys. So this will be fun. We'll, we'll do it. We'll do it justice, I'm sure. <laughs> Hope so. Um, so Kelly, would you take us through um, just kind of the basics of the two, please? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, you guys. So we talked last week about the one, or yesterday, God, <laughs> I have no concept of time. We talked yesterday about the one, and I kind of hit on some of the core sort of tenets of typeness uh, for each type. So we'll do the same. We'll repeat that for the two today. So the two is typically called the helper. Okay. Um, these folks are heart center people. So we're moving away from the body triad of numbers, which is the eight, nine, and one. And we're now we're moving around the circle. You'll have to grab a diagram to check this out. But the two starts the heart center or the heart triad. Um, and basically what that means is the folks that are in the heart triad, that is their center of intelligence, meaning that is how they interpret and understand the world around them. They have big feels about it. Um, so the two, three, and four make up the heart triad. Um, <clears throat> the twos, well, everyone in the heart triad Remember how we talked about the body triad has the center emotion or this anchor emotion that they have access to that drives them to action, and that was anger. Well, now as we move into this more emotionally centric sort of um, intelligent center, we're going to start seeing shame and guilt pop up a lot as a driving force. Yeah. Ding, yeah. ding, ding, ding. <laughs> ding. <laughs> so this, is, this might be telling. Um, so twos also, um, they externalize their guilt, their shame. So what that comes out sometimes as is maybe a little bit of manipulation, maybe a little bit of martyrdom, um, in a healthy, <laughs> Jeremy, what? Yep. <laughs> I am convicted in guilt and shame as you Already. speak. Already. Yeah. Um, so twos are doing really well, um, are extremely like, they're just really attuned to like the needs of others, right? Their core need, their core desire is to be needed. <laughs> um, the thing that they are kind of most fixated around is feeling loved. Um, and they do that through meeting the needs of others. They often forget their own needs in doing so, but that is kind of the way that they sort of like move through the world. Um, their basic fear again is essentially the flip or the inverse of the, the desire. And that is of being unloved, <laughs> um, unwanted, uh, for who they are, for themselves. They, they often feel like they're only loved because of the things that they do for others, but they also do for others in order to feel loved. So they sort of self-perpetuate this um, cycle. Do we have comments? Jeremy, I feel like you want to jump in. Do you, <laughs> is this ringing true at all? Yeah. All <laughs> yeah. <of it. laughs> so. Yeah, um, like, I need you, I need you to put me on your couch because this is some therapy right now. 
I am not qualified for that. However, <laughs> I can tell you what the book says. Um, so the thing, let's see what else is important about the twos. They can be nurturing. They can be super empathetic. Um, again, one of the biggest problems and things that the two kind of suffers from is this self-sacrificing sort of nature. Um, a lot of times they are not in check with what they're, what they need. Um, their passion is pride. So the thing that they struggle with the most is pride. Um, the thing, their mental fixation is the way of like sort of driving that, um, ego perception that they're after is flattery. So the thing that they do in order to sort of um, perpetuate this ideal um, image of them being like the helper, right, um, is by flattering other people. And again, that kind of, they lay it on real thick, right? <laughs> and then people feel obligated to then return the flattery back to them. So it's sort of a way of like receiving that affection um, through being flattered themselves. Um, they're very image conscious as are most of the folks in the heart triad. Um, they're very concentrated or they're very preoccupied with relationships, um, and what their standing is in the relationship. Uh, they are natural givers. Again, they're really good at discerning other people's needs, even before maybe they, they know what they are themselves. Um, I always use this analogy of, uh, the person that shows up, we're, we're military family. So we move a lot. There's always somebody that shows up on your doorstep with a casserole when you move in. It's usually a two. <laughs> um, but one funny thing about that is that the twos don't really understand boundaries. And some other types, specifically the five, um, we have very strong, sturdy, rigid boundaries that we expect to be respected. So when the boundaries are crossed, it feels really intrusive. So it's oftentimes that is a tension between the twos like, love me, love me, love me, love me, love me, love me, um, and the other types maybe, hmm. That's a little much, right? That can feel smothering. <laughs> so um, they often suffer from either this martyr complex or savior complex, either way. Um, in an in unhealth, it can uh, look transactional, like their their giving could have, you know, a receipt on the end that they're expecting back. Uh, um, again, they can be unboundaried, uh, and sometimes it feels like they're keeping score, right? So yeah. if they're <laughs> if they're not giving in a healthy way, um, it can be, well, I'm going to give, but then I'm going to call that back. Like I'm going to want that favor back. So it's almost like they're kind of putting out tokens all over. Right. And like, well, I might need to collect that. So, um, it can feel like there are strings attached, uh, some famous twos, uh, to give some context, uh, mother Teresa is a super healthy too, obviously, uh, Florence Nightingale also too. Um, some fictional twos that I thought were fun. We gave a, I don't think I did office. We did parks and rec last time. So to continue that, we feel like Ann Perkins, maybe a bit of a two, Okay. Um, sure. possibly nine, uh, but eh, I'm feeling okay about that. But then on the office, we have Andy Bernard, who is a two with a three <laughs> wing. Um, the wings of each side of the two, you've got a two with a one wing, which is called the servant. So when the two kind of pulls into that perfectionist sort of traits, um, they can not only discern the needs, but fulfill them really well and kind of perfectly. And, and they're just like, they're kind of called the machine in other terms. Like they're just like workers, worker, 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 right? Um, the two with the three wing, which is the other type of two, is called the host. So they're helping, they're throwing the big lavish party, um, but it's a very image, there's a high image sensitivity to that. So they're helping, but they definitely expect to be kind of adored for it because um, that's pulling into that three or that achiever wing. Um, common mistypes, and then I'll give you guys a chance to chime in. So twos often mistype themselves, Jeremy, you ready? Mm -hmm. As fours, mm -hmm. seven, mm -hmm. or one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Likely types that mistype as a two are nines, sixes, and sevens. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm, I could uh, be all uh, of those. You could not. You have to be one. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Okay. And the last thing I'll add is in stress. Let's, let's see. The growth point for a two. Let's start there. The growth point um, when they're, you know, just getting the best of the most out of their life. They're sort of self-actualizing in that way. They can draw from traits of the four, which connects them via an arrow. 
Um, and that helps them um, kind of have more self-knowledge and awareness of their own needs because the fours are really, really in touch with their, like the inner workings of their heart. Um, they can also tap into a really therapeutic outlet, which is self-expression through art. So journaling, movement, painting, all of those sorts plays. of things. Are- Directing plays. Um, there, that's a really good way to kind of in touch, get in touch with your feelings and not feel like it's self-centered, right? Because you're expressing it. Um, so you can kind of mask some of that guilt and shame uh, and kind of circumvent that in that way. So a stressful move for a two goes to eight. Um, and we talked about last time, you can either <laughs> do this move um, in a good way, like go to the high side of eight if you're making an intentional move, or if it's a disintegrated move, meaning you're kind of just sleepwalking and you you fall down lo- layers of or levels of health in your type as a two, and you just walk right in the basement floor on the healthy scale of the eight. Um, the high move looks like um, being able to establish and understand one's own boundaries, because eights are real good with that. Just nope, right? <laughs> they know they learn how to say no when they're being um, overused, right? And maybe taken advantage of because they put the they often put themselves in a position uh, to be sort of exploited for their for their helper kind of attitude. Um, so that can the eight can help them say no. And if they're doing that in an unhealthy way, they can become angry, mean, bossy, and vengeful. So, well, shit. did we nail you, Jeremy? Is that? <laughs> I mean. So, so, um, um, yeah, I mean, I will say for myself as a person who did grow up to be a theater director and, uh, who can be, um, who can disintegrate into, into eight, uh, fairly easily. There's a lot about a two that resonates. Mm. I don't know if I'm a two. Um, I know that I do two-ish things and I know, I feel like as we talked about yesterday, I'm related to um, twos, uh, and so I mm-hmm. feel like I understand them a lot. And the, actually, the, the, the two part of things resonates with me less than um, where they go when they're in, in, you know, like, than the four part right. and the eight part of that. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I feel like yep. those are true, uh, maybe truer than the two part, at least for me. But... Um, uh, as you are not paid to be my therapist, uh, so I will, um, <laughs> and again, not qualified. <laughs> so one interesting thing too, that I think is important. So we talked about this last time too. You can often just have influences in your life that manifest or seem like they manifest as these type characteristics, and they could just be modeled behaviors. Um, one other really important thing to consider with twos is that a lot of times women, uh, are either stereotyped as twos or feel like they're supposed to be a two because of a role that they play, sure. um, be it a mother, a soccer mom, PTA. I mean, really like any struggle a mom has, right? It's just, you know, oh, well, I'm supposed to be a two. Um, it, maybe if they're even in healthcare, right? Like a nurse that doesn't automatically make you a two. Again, it depends on the reasons why you are helping others. Um, men often are reluctant to type themselves as two. Uh, sure. For the same reasons, because of just the gender norms and stereotypes. So yeah. um, you got to peel all that back, you know, and not just, I've, I can't tell you how many women I've spoken to, like, oh, I'm a two. And then turns out they're not, a, no, they're probably, most of them turn out to be sixes, actually. So back to the likely to mistype as twos, four, sixes, and sevens feel like that's where they're supposed to be, but often okay. they're not. All right, Claire. So who do you have as a uh, potential Shakespearean twos? Well, I did the same thing I did last time. I picked at least one character for each play. So I'm armed to the teeth. So I think instead we should start with you and then we'll see if we have any <laughs> overlaps Okay. For, before I launch in. So let me just say that what I hear when I hear two, I go back to that word uh, that you used, Kelly, manipulation. Mm-hmm. Like, And, and uh, the way I read, I read the, the two is sort of like, using their helpfulness to like gain intimacy with others Mm. you know what Mm -hmm. i mean and it's that's the manipulation right so yeah so it's like hey i'm I'm doing this thing for you i'm scratching this itch or i'm Mm. providing this opportunity or i'm as you know using praise as a as a way of like um it's uh it's a way of getting close to people and, yeah. And that's the Did you say intimacy? Yeah, that's for yeah. sure. Yeah, and, it's and, it's 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it, I um, and it's like as with all of these things. I mean, there's a there's a good version of that, um, the sure. sort of trust building, and there's a bad version of it, which is sort of um, manipulation and um, um, it turns into I think passive aggression. Um, mm-hmm. So so you were talking about how like twos sort of might build up this um this this sort of invisible and unspoken sort of accounting ledger of all of the things that you haven't done for them while they've been busy doing things Mm -hmm. for you uh and so there's a lot of uh resentment that builds and the the passive aggression where you know like hey i baked you this cake and then i babysat your dog and then and then and then and then and they don't feel like you've returned the favor. And so there's a it, the well, potential. It, it turns into like a rejection narrative, actually. Yeah, like yeah, it's yeah. like, then, yeah. Uh, oh, you don't love me as much. My suspicion mm-hmm. is when that happens, there's a blow up of the eight variety. <laughs> yes, <what> I mean? <laughs> probably um, if, well, yeah. Cause they run themselves into the ground so often because they are busy out, like doing all these things. Like you, you have to take time for yourself, but that because of the guilt, shame sort of cycle, um, that seems impossible. And then yes, the eight, blow up is real and um not fun to see <laughs> so so with that in mind uh i have a i have a few um uh and well the other thing i, I just want to say is the other thing that resonates with me is that the the giving part of that is um it, like they get themselves into positions where they're compromised in some way because they're they're giving beyond their means does that, you know, like, oh, so, so like, I'm just going to give, give, give until I'm burnt out. But there are other versions of that, like, uh, and the character I'm going to speak about in a minute, like there's a financial version of that, or there's an emotional mm. version of that. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. So, anyway. It's kind of writing checks you can't cash because you yeah, feel like the payoff yeah. will be bigger than, yeah, yeah, I Anyways. get that. So um, I'm starting with the top of my list is Antonio, who is, uh, who is the most Antonio- Merchant of Venice. Mer- of yeah. Merchant of Venice. Um, the, the title character in that play, who, um, I, I mean, um, the story with him is that um, he, uh, he wants to be, he wants to be, he wants to get that affection we were talking about. He wants to be in close with people. And he, in this case, literally extend, overextends himself on a loan um, to someone who, he probably loves a lot um, and who he wants to be desires to be intimate with. So he's like leveraging his personal capital in all senses of that word uh, to get in close with someone. And it's, and he's um, he overextends himself. And then uh, later in that play, when that affection is not returned quite in the way that he wants it to be, um, he does he does have some resentment over it so i'm i'm pitching him as a as a two uh and he's he's pro- of the of the people on my list i'd argue that he's he's probably the most prominent of the characters that i would talk about uh that i'll talk about tonight uh so that's antonio but i have i have several others i have um uh buckingham and richard the third who's like richard's like number two i mean sorry (laughs) but uh uh the the sense is there too it's not just that he's a helper although he is he's doing a lot of richard's dirty work and things like that but he's doing it specifically to gain favor and to gain intimacy and to Mm -hmm. gain position yeah and when he is being led to the chopping block late in that play he talks about how all of these things that he did did not gain him the favor that he was hoping for. And he's, he spends time lamenting that. Yeah. Um, Benvolio in Romeo and Juliet is another helper figure. Yeah. Um, and, and he does, I mean, he's to me, he's a healthy two because I see him as guileless. He is not doing it for, um, for, um, I mean, he, he is intimate with several of the characters in that play, um, Mercutio and Romeo specifically, but he's, he, he doesn't seem to be manipulating anyone um, consciously. Uh, he does seem to be gaining intimacy with people. Um, and 
and he gains the trust that I think a healthy two would gain. Um, so there's uh, another two in that play, I think, uh, is, um, is uh, Friar Lawrence, who um, is, um, who does use his helpfulness as a sort of way of gaining a, a, an intimate relationship, a mentor-student relationship. I do see him as one who like moves to the, the creative four quality uh, when he's when he's sort of energized and integrated and things like that. Um, and there is some absolute manipulation going on uh, in that character. Um, so uh, I also think Mariah in Twelfth Night, who's this um, this uh, sort of um, uh, I don't know what the she's she's uh, Olivia's woman, and it is is sort of built into the household as someone who helps her, but is also clearly building up resentment about that throughout the play. Um, uh, Sebastian uh, in uh, the Tempest, uh, and then I. Um, uh, two characters, I think, in King Lear, and actually, I was talking to Claire about this earlier. Um, yeah. I think Kent is a two. He's a really yeah. great, healthy two who's helping out. Um, is, it, is it healthy? Is I, he healthy? Well, <laughs> we can we can argue about that. I think Ed, Edgar is a two. Yes, I, I also agree. think there's an argument that Regan and Goneril are twos. No. And but we're gonna fight about that, and that's fine. Um, I think there's a chance that they're twos, or at least have some high two qualities, as might Edmund and as might Gloucester. And if that's true, if my theory is true, then that's a play about all of these people who are like helping each other, helping each other, but it's really just building resentment, and they're sort of play acting the the helpfulness. Do you know what I mean? It, and it's really just about favor making. Um, and so Claire wants to fight me about that. So we will. I can see that. I can't wait. <laughs> um, uh, but the last three I have. So um, in the most famous play of all, I think Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are twos in all likelihood. I mean, they're I pretty. I have Rosencrantz, but not Guildenstern. Okay. Well, we'll fight about that too. Um, and then um, this is a lesser known character, but she's so great. Um, and I can't decide if she's a two or an eight. Uh, and therefore she has my problem. Uh, I think on, <laughs> I think on paper she's an eight. Um, I and mean, that's this is Constance in King John, uh, which is one of the great characters in a play that nobody ever does. Yeah. Um, but she I, she she definitely presses like an eight and is angry like an eight. And I don't want to. I'm I'm I, I I'm I'm happy to concede that point. But the two part of her as the sort of um, uh, making very clear aggressively and passive aggressively that she is helping everyone that she is the she is the giver in the room she's the the mother of the future king kind of thing i think um or uh i i think or the would-be king um i think i i don't know i think she could be a two who uh is in stress a lot and therefore we see mostly eight does that make sense yeah, I just disagree. Okay, well, let's I, fight. Let's I fight. I think it's coming from. No, <laughs> you like, bring I, your eight, and I'll bring my my eight wing if I'm a two, and we'll we'll go at it. <laughs> You're not an eight wing, dear. That's not eight wing, but my eight my okay. eight arrow. <laughs> eight <laughs> arrow too. I'll be in stress for a minute. I'm just gonna fact gonna, check gonna, all day. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. No, Rose. no. I think that like one of the things I came back to as I went through all of the plays earlier today um, that, you know, could never have been intentional on Shakespeare's part, but I found very few mothers that are twos that I actually read as actual twos. And that seems like a really awesome progressive I love that. of the plays mm -hmm. of the plays in, in Shakespeare's works, because um, I just couldn't locate many mothers who seemed authentically two, as opposed to performing the two. Mm -hmm. I think Constance and Lady Capulet are brilliant at performing the two. I don't think they are twos. I think that they know how to do it. I mean, Lady Capulet struggles because she's like 26 and never wanted kids to begin with, but like she's trying to perform two. 
Constance is, 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 I think, a much better actor. But I think that Constance is a, a three or an eight. Because she, she represented Brittany, which at this time was struggling to maintain its independence from England and its, its own, like, regency. Because she, she was the Duchess of Brittany. She ruled that region. And she wanted it to remain independent of um, the sort of iron fist of authority that was coming from, from the English throne. And um, she, you know, the real Constance of Brittany, like, was so proud of her heritage and proud of her power. And like, she really wanted to not only put her son on the English throne, but she wanted her family name to carry um, a weight and uh, credibility that exceeded her male peers in the, in, the ma in the English aristocracy. And so like, to me, she's like, she's an achiever. And she, in, in the way that Shakespeare writes here in King John, she is like, force of nature she is as you say Jeremy like she is defensive and articulate and angry and like she commands the room she is all self-assurance but I I think she can perform the very very maternal very giving like see all the wonderful things I am capable of I think she can I think she can put that mask on I just don't think it's what's driving her and I think uh, what Kelly was talking about yesterday with Enneagram is like, it's really about figuring out what the motivations are. And mm -hmm. I don't think that fundamentally any of Constance's motivations are to help. Does that make sense? No, I, 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 uh, I, I agree with you that she is not that generous of spirit. I do think she uses the, 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 she calls attention to the ways that she helps. Does that make sense? And like, yeah. And that's the manipulation part where and, and the resentment building part where she does seem to me to sort of keep an account of all of the ways that other people have not done what she's done. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the so it's it's that it's that piece that 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 lands for me. Interesting. OK, I have some I have some data points to sprinkle in for you guys to consider. So when we're talking about twos and eights and we're trying to determine the difference between the two, um, there are three big questions to ask. And this is coming from Ginger Lapid Bogda's book. Um, I'll have to we'll drop links for all the books. Um, leadership, decision making and anger are three things that are pretty easy to start distinguishing between a two and an eight. Um, Leaders, twos view leadership. Like if the question is, do you believe you were born to support others and lead when it's necessary, only when it's necessary, or were you born to lead, organize and make big things happen? So twos will step into leadership, but they don't seek it out. Um, and eights feel like they were born to lead. Like it's just, it's part of their makeup. Um, decision making, uh, what do you trust? Your, he your heart, your head, or your gut when it comes to making decisions? A two is going to feel it out. And an eight will just know in their body, like it's an it's an instinct. Um, and then their orientation around anger, like or how they perceive anger, how they describe anger, um, and how they express it, are big points. So twos aren't typically angry, um, but they can boil over, um, and it's surprising. And it they they feel it as an emotion, as like a lot, um, and might even be a little bit alarming for them. An eight, it's kind of like an everyday sort of, it's like sweating, you know, it just is, <laughs> like it's just a function. That, that sounds like Constance to me. All right. You, you persuaded me. All, all three of those, all three of those yep, points. Thank I agree. you for that, Kelly. Yep. Yeah. You're that's, welcome. That's, yeah. that's Constance. So when, when, when we get to eight though, and we talk about the good parts of eights, cause they're not just angry monsters. I have to say. They are not. I know. Monsters. Except <laughs> for Claire. Once we, once we get to episode eight, we should come back to Constance because we should look at the good things that she does and represents. Well, well, for she, sure. Anyways, in many ways, she is the moral center of that play. So we should we should come back to that when we get there. Um, so in terms of Antonio from Merchant, like that was the first one I thought of too, Jeremy. Um, I think that uh, in a similar way, we were, we were talking about you know Henry Bolingbroke, Henry IV being like the archetypal one yesterday. I feel like Antonio from Merchant of Venice just like embodies everything that Kelly has told us about twos thus far, um, and the. What's, what's tricky for me about twos, and perhaps this is why I struggle to type characters, is because I, I was like, well, if they're doing it in order to get love or affection from one specific person, 
is that the same as wanting to help like other people like like help lots of people right like if if the desire is to get the affection from that one source which is absolutely what it is for antonio does that does that mean that like they're not a two because they don't actually have the desire to 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 um steward that kind of love in other places with other people as well like i, I don't know it's, it's just a question that i sort of kept coming back to and you go first have... kelly because i have an answer okay. 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 From life so experience, I, maybe. Oh, probably. Yeah. So, um, I'm feeling like the answer to that question maybe lies in something called the subtypes or instinctual variants. Um, y'all. Okay. So each of the nine types actually can also be broken down into three subtypes. So you either have, it's, it's called an instinctual stack or, um, just your, your instinctual variant, meaning think, think like Maslow, right? Or, you know, any kind of hierarchy of needs where you've got um, self-preservation needs that come first for you. Like, so you're either dominant in a self-preserving self -preserving sort of nature. Um, and this is like deep in you, like this is animalistic almost, like this is just okay. your go-to sort of um, mechanism or way of like orienting yourself in a space uh, is self-pres. So these folks are concerned about the temperature, right? A two would be concerned, did everybody get enough to eat? You look hungry. I need to feed you, right? Then there is the social subtype, which is more group oriented. So that's more community, that's tribe, that's um, sort of the good of the whole. So they are going to sprinkle out their helping a bit farther. Okay. Um, and then the next step up from that is called sexual or intimate or one-to-one. -one. Um, it isn't necessarily like, you know, sexual in nature. It's more about um, like a one-on-one -on -one sort of pairing. Um, you that type, the sexual subtype for those who are dominant in that will go to a party and they want to connect deeply with one person. So oh. that's going to influence exactly what I think you're talking about. It's kind of like the, the greater concern, right? What is the biggest way that I can help? It's either because I'm self pres I'm social or I'm sexual. So great, Jeremy. Yeah. So I was going to, um, 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 for, for reasons that, that I, we could all write papers about and some of, some of them have, uh, uh, Antonio is to me, uh, uh, a sexual subtype of two yes. because yes. he wants that intimacy, but it's really interesting because, because he like nudges the social piece too, because he's like this, this investor, he clearly has ambitions, which is part of that social subtype of two. Um, yeah. he, he is wanting to, to sort of he is a citizen in that regard, but it's clear. I mean, he, the first line of that play in sooth, I know not why I am so sad is about the hole in his heart, his loneliness. Uh, and he realizes that it is, is with, uh, Bassanio, uh, that, that, that hole can be filled or he wants to realize that I should say. And, um, so it, that's, that's very clear to me, um, on the, on, on his side. But I think, What's interesting to me about that play, because the other name I didn't write down from that play, um, but that I wonder if could be a two, is Shylock. And if yeah. Shylock is a two, I it, wondered that too. He he would be more of the social type because yeah. he does speak his language is about community, um, and and justice for that community and and yeah. all of those things and and so um. And that would, that's an interesting play too, because it, it pits those two twos against each other. Which is, I like that. I mean, it's a similar, it's a similar quandary to what we were talking about with Othello, if Desdemona and Iago are ones, and Measure for Measure, which, you know, is a play that essentially sets itself on fire because the two ones are just never, ever gonna, they're never gonna see eye to eye, and one of them has all the power, so it's gonna end badly. Um, so that, knowing that, thank you for explaining that, because that's going to justify some of the choices in my list, because I feel like there's there's not much consistency here. There's lots of different kinds of characters, and it was because I wasn't sure, I wasn't sure what, um, I wasn't sure the breadth to which a two could kind of cover. Mm, so by knowing it's that, huge. Mm -hmm. By knowing that those subtypes exist, I feel like that legitimizes some of my weirder picks. So that's nice. Give us a um, So it actually... Sorry. Go, oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Y'all go. Give us some weird ones, Claire. Some weird ones. Okay. So um, by weird, I basically, I, I mean obscure. 
Um, I'm not trying to like cast judgments on these characters <laughs> per se. Um, so from As You Like It, I have Silvius, the yeah. poor besotted shepherd boy who has no sense of identity without the love of this one girl. Um, from uh, <laughs> this is this is one where I was thinking about you, Jeremy. From Love's Labor's Lost. <laughs> I had Don Armato and Longaville and Maria. And I think that's why Longaville falls in love with Maria. I think, and, and vice versa. I think they recognize a like innate two-ishness and they are both very much drawn to it. Because Longaville is the least problematic of the four boys. He's got the smallest ego and he's like the nicest. And Maria is like the sweetest and least combative of the girls. And they, they both have this desire to like sow friendship. Like their lines are always the ones where they're like, let's all have fun together as opposed to like, let's banter you know each other's pants off so i think that longaville and maria like recognize a, t a, a joint tuitionist and that is why they're drawn together and i think that our motto has spent his whole life just aching to be loved i think that is like fundamental to his character and i think that he like he like vomits love and affection onto people in the hope <laughs> that some of it will come back to him um i mean like he has an, un mm -hmm. he's an unhealthy loyalty to the king of navarre who basically Ferdinand just spends his time mocking him. So I, I think that like, that is perhaps when you played our motto, I don't want to, I don't want to make any assumptions here, but that may have been something you resonated with Jeremy. <laughs> the fact that our motto <laughs> is like deep, deep seated tuishness. Um, and I, I wonder if that's also part of why audiences almost universally love our motto. Like, I wonder if that's part of the reason why mm. we are so, so apt to love him besides the fact that his lines are funny and he's a you know he's a spanish dandy so there's so much to play with i i think also like he has profound pathos in a play where there's a lot of artifice around love and so i wonder if like his um the authenticity of his desire to connect with people and to help people um i wonder if that's part of what helps us like uh love him in each production um, from Measure for Measure, this poor girl, I have Mariana, who's stuck between the feet the combating to the combating ones. She's this two who just, just desperately wants the love of a man who could never possibly deserve her, but of course she feels like she doesn't deserve him, and she's just got that classic teenage girl um sense of inadequacy, you know? Um Okay, here's one that I wanted your help with, Jeremy. From A Midsummer Night's Dream, I, I'm almost positive that Helena and Snout are both twos, but I also think that Oberon might be a two because it's always baffled me why this king, who seems like such a jackass for the first scene that he's in, sees the Demetrius Helena scene. And the first thing he says when Puck comes back, he's like, oh, there's this girl. She's in love with a guy who doesn't love her back. I can get the flower to help her too. That's always been odd to me that that's yeah, where think, his brain was. It, I think so too. And I mean, the, the you know, the argument uh, that, that Oberon is in at the top of that play is about affection that he is not getting, yeah. that he wants. Sure. Um, and yeah, so I, I can definitely see that. Yeah. Um, from uh, Much Do About Nothing, I have Hero. Um, I will do any modest office my lord to help my cousin to a good husband um i think that you know despite the fact that she has she has a fun frivolous spirit in the similar way to beatrice even though she talks less i think hero fundamentally wants to like she she wants to sow affection she wants to um to sow kind of like human connection um she she desperately tries to convince her jerk father that like she she is a virgin not because the it's not because the when she has that speech, it's not that her um, reputation matters so much. It's she doesn't want to lose her father's love. She doesn't want her father to you know to hate her. And um, but yeah, I think she's I think she's quintessential. Inter interestingly, because as you're talking, I it, I also wonder if if uh, Leonardo isn't a, a two as well. Mm -hmm. That would be an interesting father that daughter piece, and because he he yeah. does sort of play for that. Uh, affection too, and of course he erupts sure. late in the play with some stressful eightishness. Yes, um, yes. And when he's integrated, he becomes this sort of creative weirdo uh, who's plotting, you know, <laughs> ways of getting people together. And he's he's doing the sort of like he does the thing Capulet does, which is sort of like I don't know, get cute, 
you know, like he becomes an actor <laughs> literally. And, um, yeah. and so anyway, that would be cool. Cause they're a father daughter thing. And, and the, the and I like, passing traits I like on idea, from one to the other. I like the idea that she's a two wing one, right? She's got the reformer perfectionistic side and he's a two wing three. He is the host. I mean, he's literally the host mm-hmm. of that play, but I think he also likes to be the guy hosting the party. I think that's in his nature. So that would be cool to explore. Social twos also look a lot like sevens, the enthusiast. So that might add a little bit of weight too. Yeah. 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 Okay, great. So from Pericles, yesterday I had mentioned that I'm, I'm pretty sure Marina is a one and I stand by that. But I think that the other two major women in the show, in so much as that play has major women, uh, is Thaisa and La Corda. I think they're both twos. And this is where I found for the first time mother characters or mother figures who actually seemed like real twos as opposed to the Constances and the Lady Capulets in which it seemed performative. Um, La Corda and Thaisa seem to be fundamental twos. Um, and uh, La Corda, of course, has very few lines and Thaisa is, you know, in a few scenes and then dies. Um, but I think that, like, they both they both fundamentally, like, they just exude um, compassion. And they, like, are, they just, every room that they're in, they are, like, affirming and lifting up the people that they love, the people they want to receive love from. Um, and I think the scene, the scene in which Thaisa first meets Pericles, she's very intentional about, like, trying to not so, maybe not so subtly, like, drop hints that he's the one I like, Dad. He's the one that I want. Um and uh, yeah, so I think I think Pericles is is one play where we actually have mother figures that maybe actually live up to the, the two. Um, Taming of the Shrew, I have is it Tranio or Tranio? Tranio. Tranio. I can't say any of the names in that play. Um, <laughs> Tranio. Like I couldn't think of anyone for the longest time. Like I thought that Taming might be the one play in the canon that didn't have a, a two, and maybe that's part of why it's so like such a caustic bitter story because there aren't any helpers to be found but I think that Tranio he has a weird weird loyalty to Lucentio Lucentio god I can't do the names but like he uh he invests in his in his master and his master's romantic quarry in a way that very few servants in Shakespeare do wholeheartedly like he kind of buys in in a way that it's hard for me to believe unless it's sort of in his nature to be a giver and a helper. Thoughts on that? I don't disagree. I was yeah. thinking as you were talking about other twos in that play, and um, although I think I'm wrong, this is another two, another two eight debate would be uh, Katarina in that play um, because uh, of the sort of the position she's in in terms of emotional manipulation. I just keep coming back to that word. I think it governs it's everything a, a two does. Two. I said yesterday, I think twos are the worst, and I think they are because <laughs> they are So that might be always... where you need to sit for a minute, Jeremy, because usually that's where people find their type. Richard Rohr <laughs> says twos are always on the make. That's what he says. Mm-hmm. There's mm. always a game oh, being played. It's always like, like uh, you think I'm being nice, but really what I want is something from you. And it's always a, you said transactional earlier. And, and um, that's where, that's why I think um, it, and it does erupt and bubble up into, into um, scary aggression that they're not always in control of. And that's, that's why I, I always, um, always wonder uh, about someone who's who's presenting as an eight, whether they've they're they've got that manipulation part under it, you know what I mean? And if they do, I'm like, are you two really? And you're just like, and, <laughs> but honestly, that might be how I know for sure that I'm not a two. That might be why I struggle to understand the two because I don't, I can't really be manipulative. Like I I am too, my heart's on my sleeve. I'm too candid. I would suck as a manipulator like i don't have so that, that the eights move to two looks more like embracing vulnerability 
yeah that's why you need the two um you can be warm and compassionate and kind of chill um but that's your kind of reach in there that's what you benefit from so that sounds right Mm -hmm. (laughs) um okay so twos are not the worst for the tempest (laughs) also i like i like that we're thinking of like these big sat adjectives like sat words for each type like yesterday we had prosecutorial Today we have transactional. I'd love it if like with each episode we can try to think of one stupidly like obnoxiously pretentious word that like kind of sums up how they can behave in social situations. Because okay. because at least at least with Shakespeare's plays, we get to know the characters mostly by how they engage with each other. And so to have a a, a very kind of active um a, a adjective like that that helps us imagine how they engage with other characters, that's I think that's a really useful way in. So with Tempest, Jeremy, I also had Sebastian. I also think Miranda might be the, the good version of the two. I mean, she certainly flips around trying to, you know, uh, not too much Caliban, but like love on her father, help Ferdinand, learn everything, see everyone. She has the she has the line where she's like, oh, you know, beautiful new world. Like, I I don't know. I think that she um I think she thrived on like scattering affection like seed and then like watching it like come back to her well, um, interesting as you talk about the tempest because the the uh, ariel is sort of an archetypal too as well mm-hmm. forced into that position not by choice but you can see in so many of those moments with prospero the resentment building about uh, about the helpfulness that they're providing right yeah um, and that you see you see ariel move into the creative um direction of a four uh, at times and have real fun with that and also move in the stress direction of an eight with some sure. serious wrath. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, I think th- that's, um, there, and as you, as I say that, I mean, there's some, there, there's, there's maybe an argument to be made that Caliban's sort of in the same position. Um, maybe. And, and two of those characters, two of those three children of Prospero don't really have a choice about their, about their position, which I think is True. interesting about what, you know, whether a tuishness can sort of be enforced by your social position and certainly mm-hmm. in their case, by their prior experiences and in childhoods and all that. That's why I struggled with Tranio, right? Cause I was like, is it just that he's in underemployment? Is that the only reason? But it just seemed that he, uh, he invested more than, than the, the average, um, apathetic servant. Then I also had, Oh, no, what? No, I was just going to say, it goes back to a little bit about what we were talking about yesterday, right? Um, but in a different way. I mean, yesterday we were talking about how Shakespeare might have had these, uh, you know, at these archetypes in his company. Sure. He could do this thing. But um, he also had stock characters and a whole stock character tradition of servants and things like that that he was building off of. Um and so he might be playing around with, with that as well. Sure. With Troilus and Cressida, you know, this is one, I think Cressida might be a two. I know for sure that Cassandra is, and that's the great tragedy of that character because um, uh, Cassandra in Greek mythology and also in Troilus and Cressida is, she was basically cursed by uh, the god Apollo so that anytime she tried to, she basically would have the gift of prophecy. She would be able to see what's going to happen. And whenever she tried to tell people, um, it would sound like gibberish. And so it's a very, very old myth about the, um, the denunciation and the dismissal of female testimony, right? Of not listening to women when they, when they speak the truth. And uh, Shakespeare, Shakespeare takes that, that myth, mythical event and places it in Troilus and Cressida, um, not, not so much to give, like, godly, to, like, give godliness to the play, but instead um, to juxtapose the toxic masculinity that is, like, a, running amok in Troy between the two armies of all these men being like, well, you know, my my identity, my manhood, my sense of self, my pride is all, you know, tied up with how many men I can kill in battle. You have this woman, this young woman running around trying desperately to say, if you fight this battle, all of you will die. 
and none of them are listening to her. They're like, oh, she's just the crazy one in the attic. Nothing she says makes mm. sense. So I think Cassandra is a two, and I think that Shakespeare employs her very, very carefully um, in in that play uh, in order to suggest the the tragic ramifications of not listening to not just women, but like the people who are trying to help. You know, the the, the calmer, kinder more compassionate souls that are trying to help. When we dismiss those voices, tragedy ensues. Um, I also have Antonio from Twelfth Night because I think all of Shakespeare's Antonios are linked in some way. And Antonio- it's the same guy in the truth, yeah, right? It's the same actor. <laughs> that, I mean, that is, that is a great, that is a great theory from a, from a podcast that I love called No Holds Barred. These two guys have this theory that like Antonio is just the same one in all the plays. He's just like getting older. Um, so, but I think that Antonio in 12th, I mean, he is, if you can read it a lot of different ways to me, he's just unabashedly in love with Sebastian and follows him into Illyria, despite the fact that like there's, he's, you know, he's got a bounty on his head. Everyone in Illyria wants him dead. He's like a pirate. He's a social outcast, but he like braves all of that so that he can give money and, you know, affirmation to, to this young man that he's saved from the the shipwreck and uh, poor Antonio. I mean, apart from Malvolio, he's got about the, the most tragic arc in 12. Um, but I think that he is, he's very quintessentially a two. In Two Gentlemen of Verona, I have Julia, poor girl, unhealthily, unhealthily a two. If she could just find some, like she's one where I'm like, if you could just find some self-esteem, you could like rule the world. But she's got the guilt and shame levels that are just way too high for that. Um, and then closing out the comedies for the winter's tale, I had Camillo, but I don't know how much of his tuitionist is just derived from necessity because he's constantly on the run for his life. So maybe the fact that he's trying to help people is just more about like doing what he can to curry enough favor to get out alive. I don't know. That's one that I was unsure of. Um, in the in the Henry ad, I have the Duke of O'Merle, Ned Point, Bardolf, and the Duke of Exeter. They're all varying levels of two with varying levels of success. In the Wars of the Roses, I also had Duke of Buckingham for R3. I think that's brilliant. I also had Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, as like the two that gets brought low by a bunch of eights <laughs> in the Henry Sixes. Um, because he can he can explode. Like Humphrey can become eight. He, be he becomes Hulk when needed. But for the most part, like, he's trying real hard to, like, um, d uh, distribute, I don't know, like, compassion and empathy to everyone and ho hoping, uh, perhaps in a manipulative way, that that will, like, come back to him. It doesn't. Um, and then in Henry VIII, Catherine of Aragon, I think, is another, like, actual mother, too. Um, Antony and Cleopatra, I have Eros and Agrippa, which I think is interesting because Eros is very much the um, the, the loyal to the end servant of Antony and Agrippa is kind of the loyal servant to the end of Octavian. So I think it's, it's an interesting way of imagining that play, perhaps, that like the two characters who are, are like the, the most committed to their to their masters, which are on opposite sides, actually are the same the same type. Um, in Coriolanus, I struggle with this play so much. I had Menenius as a super manipulative snake-like two. Like he, like he, he's trying real hard to convince uh, the plebeians that um, that being at the bottom of the food chain, quite literally, and having no money and not being able to feed themselves is good for social order. And he's hoping that that's gonna like I don't know manifest in in political harmony doesn't really work but he tries uh in hamlet i had rosencrantz but not guildenstern so i want to hear why you have both of them i also had uh horatio as like the ultimate two maybe as like the good the good two the the, the two that goes to the good place um, <laughs> and then in julius caesar i had soothsayer portia and titinius and the reason why this made me laugh after i realized it is because i had all three of them in one track when I dramaturg to the play, that was one actor that played all three of those. It wasn't, in, I didn't realize it until I wrote all the names out. I was like, oh my gosh, that was, those were, that was all one actor. But yeah, Soothsayer, Portia, and Tinius. 
in King Lear, I also have Kent, I also have Edgar. I think you could make an argument for Goneril and Gloucester, but I have no idea where you're coming from with Edmund and Regan. I don't know why you think they're two. So I want to hear more about that. Okay. I can, I can, I, well, I'll say, um, I'll say on the Horatio thing, I might disagree. Ooh, then, what do you think he is? I think he might be a nine. Um, uh, oh, sure. And, um, and with Rose, with regard to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, I, 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 I think they're, they're both, well, they're one, they're each one of two numbers. I think they're either two or a three and one could be one or the other, but they're so closely like one could be a two wing three and one could be a three wing two. You know what I mean? Sure, so they're sure. sort of like slightly, you know, um, but I do think, I do think um, there's a general sense of um, there is a sense of ambition that you might see from an achieving three, but actually yes. the social two is also a sort of person who's, who, who centers around ambition. You know what I mean? Um, and so I don't know. That's, I see, I see that with both of those characters to, to be liked or respected. Yeah. Are differences between the two and the three, right? Uh, purpose or goals are distinguishing and then emotional patience or impatience. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of them is patient, and I think the other one is impatient. I think they're both goal oriented, so that mm. might push them into the three. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, so I, I'll talk about Lear for a minute. Um, I, Great. We only have we only have a couple minutes left, but um, yeah. I think there's a there's a real argument to be made that that play is a battle of twos. No, I don't get it. I and don't so, see that. So I'll just talk about uh, I'll talk about the so so um if we're talking just about um uh, I'll, uh um Edmund for a second I it, I think it could be a sexual two who are these like seducing manipulative types he does that with his dad he 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 presents one story to his dad as like a loving son there's there's another game being played there um and and uh he's certainly engaged in seduction later in that play um i think there's an argument that both regan and goneril even though they operate a little bit differently are like first perform hang on hang on hang on they first perform a kind of in in, in the in the in the opening of that play they're yeah. both performing affection and yeah. love and all of those things but it's all a game and and like at first goneril like she's got the she's got the most tuitionist right she is playing a host and building up resentments as as she goes regan i'm willing to entertain is is not um but i i do think there's that same kind of um manipulation and initial willingness to be seen as um, intimate and all of that. And I, I may be letting the opening scene color my, my judgment yeah. a bit too much, but I think it'd be interesting it, to read all of those characters as either healthy or unhealthy twos. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm already concerned that you think any of the characters in that play could be deemed as healthy, regardless of the number that they're Oh, I think there to. are a couple of healthy ones. Who? Well, Who I in think... that play? Who in that play is healthy? I, 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 we're, well, if we're talking about degrees of health, I think Edgar is <laughs> a little healthy. Edgar's a disaster. I think <laughs> Kent is so dumb. a little healthy. I think they're both a little healthy. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, if, if neither of those guys are in the play, someone dies even more prematurely. <laughs> they're there to help. I just think it's a play about, like, people with sh who don't have who, with shitty coping mechanisms like i just don't think anybody in that play is okay i feel like it, like all of them need years of therapy all of them like even even the side characters like even oswald i'm like get help friend i mean uh, maybe oswald's a psychopath but but uh <laughs> but kent's <laughs> okay. all right kent's an all right guy so 
since you brought up psychopath, I've been sitting on this because I didn't know if I wanted to go there, but um, let's do it. So <laughs> Riso and Hudson's book, they actually get into potential psychopathy uh, for each type. Let's talk about this because I'm pretty sure I have talk about this. <laughs> um, For the two, uh, histrionic personality disorder, hypochondriasis, so being a hypochondriac, that, no. um, somatization, which is physical symptoms uh, of emotional problems, uh, eating disorders, and <laughs> co coercive sexual behaviors um, and you have stalking. To ask someone, someone else about that one. Yeah, stalking. these are not super disordered, but stalking, stalking on the list. Yeah, yeah. So becoming kind of obsessive about what's, wanting someone to love you back. What's the? I could see that, but what's the? What's the first one you mentioned? Uh, histrionic personality disorder. So that might actually be a dated okay. term. Like I'm not sure. What all DS actors. I mean. <laughs> everyone listening he's kidding he loves that i know listen if anyone is a two listening i don't know jeremy like you may have alienated some of your audience <laughs> no no i just think it's uh, listen we, so when we talk about the enneagram we talk about the shadow side which is like the yeah. stuff that nobody wants to talk about sure you know and like only comes out with in, in therapy you know, with and and all I'm saying is is uh, the two of the all nine numbers to me the two has the most the juiciest shadow side. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And like the one that's mm -hmm. like it looks because we value we value um kind of um people are good at service. We value that. Um, do you you know in a as a culture, but like. We don't often talk about the cost of that, you know, the, and that's what I'm interested in when I talk about tooth. Cause I, that's cause I, I think their, their dark side is a little bit, um, it's a little bit more forward, you know, it's, it, uh, I don't know. I just think it, that's, that's just me. Hmm. Yeah. No, that's a good point. And one, one thing that I will bring up too, and this, I think will benefit the listeners. Um, if there is a type that offends you, or like ruffles your feathers, or you have a reaction like Jeremy is having right now <laughs> to the two, it is likely showing you sides of your shadow side that you have not wanted to confront. So it may actually mean that you need to spend a little time there uh, and consider whether or not that could be just your own sort of convictions about uh, things. So like when I read things, I'm like, oh, or about the five, I'm like, oh God, that sounds like a total like cold hearted B. I'm like, Oh, I'm upset by that because that's, I've been accused. Right. So it could actually be bringing up, um, some things that you're self-conscious about and trying to hide in that shadow. Yeah. Uh, the other ones I had smaller in Macbeth, I had Ross in Othello. I had Rodrigo who is like a disaster too. I think if ever there was one. R and J, I think Benvolio. I don't, I don't know that I agree about Friar Lawrence, but I think the nurse uh, might be um, the nurse might be a very gregarious too. Um, kind of going after the like the two presenting as a seven, which I think Kelly mentioned earlier. That that seems very <laughs> nurse to me. In Time of Athens, I think I think Timon is the two, mm -hmm. and he 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 achieves the. Um, he becomes eight by the end, by the sort of like halfway point of that play. And yeah, I think he, Flavius is a two in that play as well. Yeah. Um, just yeah, yeah. A, a, a much healthier version. A much healthier version. And then in Titus Andronicus, I think Marcus Andronicus is a mm -hmm. creepy, sleazy two. Um, mm. I think, uh, I think you're, I think you're everyone in King Lear is a two theory. I don't know if I agree with it, but I think it could make for some fantastic rehearsal discussion. Like if everyone bought in that that was what their character was, that'd be a really interesting way of, of um, examining those. I mean, I'm that. not wrong if our words are manipulation and transaction. That's that play. I just don't think Regan, I don't think Regan is, is so um, careful or uh, I don't know clean or, or pristine or, or I don't know like it seems like there's a lot of thought behind the the two that the, the evil two that you are imagining Jeremy and Regan strikes me as like an absolute gut person not a heart person she, so that would make her an eight probably as the alternative 
What are the what are the gut ones, Kelly? Eight, nine, and one. Mm. Yeah, she's an eight. I but want to come back to Friar Lawrence for a minute because well, okay, yeah. I'm I'm con- so here here's the person the character in pop culture that I think is a two, um, and I'm happy for everyone to disagree with me, but Walter White from Breaking Bad I think is a is a is a two, and because of the resent he, he's res- he's uh, he's he's resentful. He is helpful. That's what he sees his role as. He, he, it's dark. Don't get me wrong. It's super dark. But like I, I see Friar Lawrence is not as dark, but still Walter White. Like, they both cook things in their kitchens. <laughs> they're both. But why? They both have these young people <laughs> that they're trying to steward along and mentor. But it's a little like twisted. It's not like an authentic mentorship. They're, they're using someone else. Do you know what I mean? They're very concerned with, with um, sort of the the affection that they do or do not get back. Um, Walter White more than than Lawrence, I think. Um, um, yeah, and and I think Lawrence has a has a uh, potentially enormous one wing because he's very concerned about the the sort of legal side yeah. of everything he's doing um, and does present things as sort of in a sort of lawyerly way at times. So anyway, that's my, that's my argument. I think Not Lawrence is Walter really, White. really into plants <laughs> in the Walter White Wait, sense. Did you say plans or plants? Plants. Okay. He's also into plans. I mean, bad plans, but yeah. he's also into those. Yeah. So resentment is going to be le- okay. So I hear what you're saying about resentment, but I also don't know how far that goes as like a core sort of struggle mm-hmm. or passion. Um, so again, for the two, it's pride. Um, so it is much more. Um, it's less about being upset with other people and more about feeling let down. Um, so it is a little more about their emotional capacity to deal with not being loved and kind of feeling empty. Like their heart feels kind of empty um, and they're expecting other people to fill it up. So it's not so much about like being upset or angry at other people um, as it is about like being feeling conflicted because they feel like they're giving love, but they want love back and they're not getting it. And they struggle with shame around the way in which they do it because they know what they're doing. Right. Like to some extent. Um, so the resentment I'm struggling with latching onto that. Well, the way um, I would, the, the way I would explain it to the extent that I understand this at all. Right. Is, is <laughs> me that, too. <laughs> is, is the, is the sort of invisible accounting that sometimes they don't even know that they're doing mm-hmm. like a balance sheet where they're adding up all of the favors that they've done and all the affection that they've sown and all of this. And then something in the back of their head, and sometimes I think they're conscious about it maybe, and sometimes they're not, is the gap between the credit that they've built and the repayment plan of others, right? Mm. And so that gap is the resentment gap that I would be talking about, right? Yeah. I think that comes out a little more as like, oh. You know, like mm. not so much resentment. Again, I'm I'm putting that in terms of like a one lens. And maybe that if a one influences the two, like as a wing, then that definitely would play a part. Um, but it is, it's more about like, pay attention to me. Pay attention. I'm right here. Like mm. I'm doing all of this. And then not only that, they're not going to stop giving once the ledger is kind of filled up. They're going to keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing, yeah. keep pushing, keep intruding on that boundary. You are going to love me, right? Like very like it has to happen otherwise like what am i right what am i without the love from other and affection from others so and that yeah that to me is gone wrong that is like mm-hmm. that is the tragedy of that character she won't admit it but she just desperately wants affection mm-hmm. and well, she and, wants, and, wants and, to be validated and no one does it except for edmund but he has his own reasons yeah and she she plays the host there right for, for quite yeah. some time until she can't take yeah. it anymore. And she's sort of worn, yep. she's burned out. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think, um, speaking of that play being about twos, Fool could be a two. 
<laughs> sure. <laughs> Everyone in that place. And, and actually, I was thinking about this Except this afternoon. Cordelia. There, there's an argument to be made that lots of lots of fools are twos. I was thinking about parolees and um, all's well that ends well. I was I thinking about, about Festy. I, I I think parolees is and Festy isn't. Um, but I, th I think there's because of that sort of servant role that they play. There's an argument that they they're they're they they end up in that helper position. And so we read them as twos a lot. Right. And so I, I tried not to include too many servants for that exact reason. Um, so I think that does it for, for twos for today. We beat that horse dead. Yeah, we did. <laughs> for twos. We love you. We need you. To everybody, <laughs> to everybody who not only endured the, the barrage of like angsty uh, two venom, but also who dealt with all of the technical difficulties we had earlier we say thank you so much we appreciate you you can yell at me if you think i was us. too mean to twos you are not jeremy i may fine. be working <laughs> things out you might be <laughs> it's fine so, it'll be interesting here. because i also think i might be a three or a four or a five or or a an eight so i right. probably i'll pro like i didn't think i was as a one as much as much you know what i mean but like we're getting Just into into six. authentic. What if we candidates. crossed off? What if we crossed off? I Let's don't keep think a I'm a nine. I'm I'm positive you know, I'm not a nine. Not to nine yet. So what's funny about nines is they merge with every other type. Yeah. So they actually have a really hard typing or hard well, time this typing. This is why I'm like, uh, well, okay. I identify with all of them, so maybe Jeremy. I'm a nine. But then I like. <laughs> or you're a four because you we can't be typed. Be yeah, we yeah. could be here all night, but our listeners have lives. So let's let them get back. We can to make it. this a marathon, like episode no, ten. No, no. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to come back on Monday, fresh and rested, with stronger Ethernet cables, and we're going to try this again. And we're going to pick up with type three, which is the achiever. I think. Yep. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about achievers, and all of you can look forward to that. My therapist thinks I'm a I'm a three. So <laughs> we'll talk about that Monday. Okay. Awesome. Everybody, thank you. Thank you for tuning in today and for listening with us. It's been a treat. TTFN. Bye. If you enjoy the work of Sweet Tea Shakespeare, you can find us all over the socials. We're on Facebook. We have a special secret Facebook community group that we'd love for you to join. Uh, we're on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, you name it. We're on it. We're even starting TikTok. Uh, so join us, click in, give us a like, uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you in all of those places. If you'd like to contact us, we urge you to do so at ours at sweetteashakespeare.com. That's H-O-U-R-S at sweetteashakespeare.com.